Good morning, welcome to another drawing tutorial. Today we're going to work on the portrait of a man, a man with a very interesting face. And this portrait is going to give us some interesting difficulties, there's some fun challenges I should say, because he's old and he has great character, he also has this facial hair. We haven't done a lot with facial hair yet. And finally, his face is in some strong shadows. So, the first thing that I did was to print it out three times. This one is a different color of gray, so I can pick up a little bit more detail in the light places on the face. But this side of the face was so dark I lost all detail. I lightened it up a little bit and I got a bit more detail. And then I lightened it up the most and I got the most detail out of this side, but you see I lost a lot of detail in the light struck side. So using those references together, they're all the same size, I'm going to be able to see the detail on this side of the shadow and the detail on the light struck part. So if you have a similar problem, that's the solution that I suggest. So the first step here is to measure the length and the width of your reference material. I did that and I found that the width is 9.25 inches and the height is six inches and then I want to develop an exact proportional rectangle on my drawing paper. Not the same size but a proportional size. So to do that I'm going to set up a proportion, a mathematical equation that sets 9.25 over 6 equal to the length and width that I want my paper to be. So you have to just decide one side. I went with the longest and I found that on my drawing paper the longest that I can make my length and not have it run over is 11.25. I could go a little bit bigger but I like to have a bit of a margin. So I want 11.25, I set that equal to my 9.25 of the original reference material and then on the bottom of my proportions here, let me just write it a little bigger so you can see, so 9.25 over 6, that's the width to the height, width, height. Let's set that equal to 11.25. Oh, good grief, I wasn't even on there. Okay, let's try this one more time. So, when you're setting up your math problem, you have your width and your height. The width of the reference material is on the left and your drawing material is on the right. So, my reference material width, I have the 9.25 inches and the height of it was 6 inches. Set that equal to 11.25 inches because that's how wide I want my drawing paper to be. But this side is X. I don't know what it is yet. Then you cross multiply 11.25 times X or 11.25 times 6 equals 9.25 X. So that'd look like this. X equals, oh, I don't know what that would be. It'd be 67 something approximately. I already figured it out on my calculator. So, And then you're going to divide the 9.25 out of both those sides and the result is that x equals 7.3. So I know that on my drawing paper I need to draw a rectangle that is 11.25 inches wide and 7.3 inches high. Ta-da! Already done. So then step two is that I'm going to divide the sides into these equal increments on both the reference material and the drawing material. On my reference material, by the way, I cheated a little bit to make it easier on myself and I went up a tiny, tiny speck here to make it an even six inches, otherwise it was 6.1 or something like that. Easier to divide this way, so you can do the same. And then, I measured and I found the center point, divided that into half, and divided that half into half, 
and I came up with these eight equal increments around the top and I transposed them to this side as well. And I did the same thing, measuring the length here, or the height, found the middle, divide that middle into half, divide that half into half again, and have these eight equal increments here. Then I did the same thing on my drawing paper and I labeled A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I across the top and bottom and one through nine from side to side. And once that is all done, you have a handy, great external grid that you can use to lay out your drawing. Let me show you how to do that. Before I start, let me make a comment. You don't have to draw this way. In fact, I didn't used to draw this way. I used to just kind of start with the shapes. So here I'd start with an oval and then I'd draw the body and, and then I'd kind of clean it up from there. And that is absolutely fine. Um, the problem is that it's a lot more difficult. It can be a lot more timely and it can be a lot more frustrating. So now, it's not because I don't have the skill to draw that way anymore, but I really value precision in my drawings and my paintings, and so I just start with a grid, knowing that it's going to save me time and help me to be more accurate from the beginning. It still requires a lot of um, traditional drawing skills. It's just a different way of laying out. Okay, so if the uh, if it's not that important to you that you be really precise, you can do it the old-fashioned way, laying out the head as a shape and the shoulders as a shape and just sort of making your measurements as you can with your eyeballs and your fingers and your pencil and so forth. Um, I just prefer to do the grid. It's cleaner, it's faster, it's more efficient, and it's easier. It does take a little bit more time in the beginning, however, which is something that you need to be aware of, otherwise it gets frustrating. So first I'm going to find this line of the side of the face. I'm going to do that by laying down a straight edge right on the line and then extending the angle lines to the outside of my graph. So right here, DE and EF. DE, EF make it look about the same and there's a line I'm going to draw very lightly because I know that all of these are going to be erased. I'm going to do the same for this side of the face not the outside of his ear but the side of his neck here. Extend those lines you see what I'm doing? Yeah. So almost on the D uh, down here and BC, almost on the D and the BC. And that looks about parallel, which it does in the drawing as well. So that's a good indication that I'm doing it correctly. To find these lines are the easiest because they intersect the graph. So the outside of his suit should be right between A and B and should go up to about the seven and in line with the B. Then I'll take those measurements over to my drawing paper. Seven, B, so I know his shoulder's gonna be right here. And then it's gradually going to rise to point six and then CD. Six, CD, so about here. So I can just roughly sketch that in. Then on this side of the suit, it's going to intersect a little bit after the G, rise up to about the six and going into about G. So I sketch that in and then it comes over on a gentle slope that ends a little above the six and How about here? And now I'm just using 
time and my eyes to see where this side of the lapel intersects and this side of the lapel and so on. So as you do this, focus on those largest shapes first. So see what I have so far? The shape of his head, not even the whole shape of his head actually, just the sides of his face and the big blocky shape of his suit. I'm not putting on noses, I'm not putting on eyebrows or eyelashes or anything like that. You build your picture from the large shapes down to the smaller shapes. Just like you're baking a cake and stacking up those layers. So the big layer first, and then as you get more comfortable with the way things are going and that you have enough room for all of your um, features, and it's looking correct, you start adding on those smaller shapes on the top. So I'm going to just sketch in the shape of his head. I'm going to give myself a mark. See the top of the ear is about four. Bottom of the ear is at about five. So if this is the outside of his ear, and his hair comes up like this, is that going to look right? You see what I mean about needing to use your common sense and your artist's eye as well as your graph when you're doing these state, uh, this layout stage. Then also be aware of where you've measured. So remember this line, it wasn't the outside of the hair, it was the outside of the face. That would change things significantly. So I have the outside of his face, so on top of that I'm going to put the shape of the hair. And then in line with the nose, I'm going to have a guideline for the eye. And I'll put on a guideline for the nose. Oh, in line with the ears, I have a guideline for the eye. And I'll put the bottom of the nose is usually in line with about the bottom of the ears. His face is tilted slightly up, so that's going to look a little bit different. But then as I place these features, I'm going to first put them down as boxes. You can even make measurements to make sure that those are very accurately placed. So I like to measure everything in terms of the eye length. I'll mark down one eye length on the reference material and then I see that it is about one eye length from the side of the eye, Ooh, two eye lengths from the side of the eye to the ear here. The eyes are one eye length apart and for this far eye, I can't see this inside corner because it's hidden by the nose. But then from that corner to this one, there's a little bit less than half of an eye length. So I can take those measurements back to my drawing paper, make a new eye length for what I've got down, then measure one, whoops, careful, one, two, and that is my ear, so that would be a good place. Eye length apart, and that's starting about right there, and then corner of the head is a little less than half. So I actually eyeballed it very well. So I can now, knowing that those are accurate, I'll finish my boxes, and then inside those boxes I will draw the shape of the eye. The most important thing to remember when you're sketching your layout is that you have to do it lightly. All of these lines are going to be erased. I'm going to give myself an eye measurement for the nose placement as well. So from the bottom of the eyelid here, that should be, it doesn't line up very cleanly, but the bottom of the nostril is one and a half eye widths down. So let me do that too. One and a half. That'd be about here. So between the grid for the large shapes on the outside of the face and then the eye length 
to place those small shapes of the nose and the eyes and the features of the face, I have a good clear roadmap for where everything should go. So I'm no longer a lost wanderer in the woods of this big blank page. I have some direction here and that's exactly what you want to give yourself. Don't make drawing harder than it needs to be. It's already plenty hard, especially drawing portraits because you're going to make a lot of mistakes and you're going to make finished portraits that don't look anything like the person that you intended and you're going to be sad about that and then you know what? You're going to do it again and again and again and with time you are going to see that your portraits do start to look great but it starts with patience and these clear roadmaps. So give yourself every advantage. Take the time and lay out with your roadmaps. I have this and then a chain that comes down to about here and a shirt. And this chain should be about in this area. See what I did there too? I'm not going to draw this intricate shape in my sketch. The first thing I'm going to do is make a shape that encompasses the whole thing. This circle, boink, and that will tell me where the top and side and side intersect on his chest. And then see before I start to draw the actual scrolls of the necklace, I'll make sure after I have drawn the shirt and the lapels and the suit that this is the right size and placement for the necklace. See the chain needs to come down a little bit more like this, I see. And then only when I'm satisfied at that point will I come back and I'll start it as a rough of what I see. So here, that's a rougher shape, but it's more accurate than the circle. And then when that rough shape is cleaned up, then I'll start to draw those individual little spirals. But to begin with, just a basic rough circle. Okay, so now I'm going to go off camera and I'm going to finish up my sketch, which is just doing the same thing that you see here, only I'm going to take probably about an hour and lay out those shapes really cleanly and accurately. Always keep your kneaded eraser close at hand so that you can then erase your sketch lines and your guidelines. Don't erase your external grid lines. You'll want those. But you can erase these guidelines for the eyes that made them look like little boxes. And then you can redraw the eyes more accurately, just like this. I'm just using a regular HB pencil. It's not even an artist's pencil. So obviously the pencil isn't actually that important in your drawing process. I'll get my artist pencils out for when I start shading. But a kneaded eraser, that, that my friends, is essential. get a kneaded eraser. So you see the process here of erasing and cleaning up, erasing and cleaning up, erasing and cleaning up. That's going to go on and on and on. And I always feel like I'm sculpting actually during this, during this phase of the drawing process because I'm just kind of shaving off incorrect lines and then going a little bit deeper into the realism making one adjustment here and then seeing how that affects the adjustments in other places. So you're working up the whole drawing at the same pace. You don't just dive into the eyes and get them to 100% realistic and then worry about the rest of the face. No. Get everything working up at the same rate and don't start shading or adding dark lines to anything until you're sure on the light lines that they look correct, just like your portrait on everything. So let me get that to that uh, 
light line correct sketch phase and then I'll come back and show you how to push forward. Okay, I have worked at my outside lines and I'm satisfied that they look good enough. So next I'm going to move forward to the background. Not all drawings need a background. In fact, usually I don't draw my portraits with a background, but in this case, a lot of the dramatic emphasis comes from this really cool gradient in the background. And just in case there are some times when you want to put one in, I'm going to show you the best way to do it. So first of all, you're going to need some masking tape. Rip off strips the length of the length and the width of your picture. And then don't tape them to the paper right away. Tape them down to your clothes a few times. I like to use jeans because there's not too much lint. So I put it down, I rip it back up a few times because I don't want the pa I don't want the uh, because I don't want the tape to be too sticky. And it's okay that I cover up those lines, my grid lines, because now I have done my drawing. So everything that's left is shading and I don't really need my grid for the shading. Do that until you have the entire, all four sides blocked off. Okay, the more tricky part is to protect the entire portrait, the man and his suit in this case. So before I, uh, I'm going to have to lay down some frisket film to do that. There are two brands of fish frisket film that I've worked with. This Badger Photo Frisket Film and Graphics Frisket Film. Graphics is a lot thicker so this is the badger and this is the graphics. Maybe you can see the difference. It's a lot easier to see your lines through the badger, but it's a lot easier to draw a clean visible line on the um, graphics. So you just have to choose what you prefer. I've experimented with both. In this case, I used the badger. In other cases, I prefer the graphics, but whatever you use, Get some frisket film and then you're going to lay it down, get a piece that's big enough to cover everything, lay it down, press and outline very carefully all around the outside edge. Then you're going to cut it with some, I like to use Fisker's sewing scissors because they're really sharp and they can make a nice precise line. Cut that out and you're going to wind up with something like this. So you cut that out and then you will wind up with something like this. But before I peel off the backing and stick it down, there's one more thing I want to do. 
If you go to the portrait, you're going to see some really fine line hairs around the outside of the head. I want to make those. And the easiest way to get those is to indent the paper. So I like to use this little clay tool. It's a stylus. And it's sharp but blunt at the same time. So it's going to make a really precise line, but it won't tear my paper, which is why it's perfect for this. I'm just going to make some of these careful beard lines. Don't overdo, a little bit goes a long way. And I'm going to put some on the inside of the hairstyle. And be aware that you're not going to be able to see as much in the areas where it's dark. So on this side of the face, you won't see as much. Do make sure that if you use this technique, you use it in more than one place, or it's going to look like a mistake. especially if you start doing it in the hair that means you need to be consistent and do it throughout the hair wherever you would see those kind of lines okay now I feel like I'm ready to tamp down the background so what I like to do with this is I line it up while the backing is in place because it's easy to slide around and make tiny little adjustments. When it's perfect, I hold, hold it down with my fingers and then I'm going to cut away the paper backing Let it fall into place, tamp this down, and then I can peel away the rest. I can peel away the rest and it should fall right into place. Just like that. Then I go over the top and I tamp it down everywhere really, really well. You shouldn't be able to see any little bubbles. Excellent. And now I'm ready to start with that background. So it's darker on the right and that's where I'm going to begin. I'm going to get a charcoal pencil. This is a hard charcoal pencil. I'd like a soft. Extra soft. Perfect. And I'm going to start on the side here and just fill in. I'm going to cover the entire paper this way. I'm not pressing too hard though. Instead of pressing really hard, because when you press hard, you're going to make it more difficult to blend in the tone. So instead of doing that, I'm going to cross hatch and I'll show you what that is in just a second.
So first I need to cover everything in the background going one direction. And then I'm going to flip it on the side and go the opposite direction, parallel to the strokes that I already put down. This is cross hatching. If I need it to be really, really dark, I can do that several times. So to flip it a little bit more to a new angle and go a third direction and see how it darkens up every time. It's a good way of getting your tone down and blending it so that it stays nice and smooth. And that frisket film means that I can just cover everything without any concern at all. I don't have to stop my strokes around the face. And this is the only way that you can get a soft, smooth, uninterrupted background. So even though it's some extra work, it's definitely a tool that you want in your tool belt for times like this. Also, by going opposite directions, I can get all the way up to the edge of the face, or at least better. Now this side is lighter, so I'm going to use a lighter touch. I'm still going to fill it all in. Notice I'm going one direction. If I cross hatch, then I'll go another direction on top, but I'm keeping all of my strokes the same. So I'm not just scribbling in a haphazard manner. Now the next step here is to get a chamois cloth or your finger and blend this all smooth. Depending on how dark it, I want it to be, I'll make the decision from what tool to use. If I want it dark though, I'm going to use my middle finger and just circle stroke and grind the tone right into the paper. The reason why this isn't a fantastic way to do it is obviously my finger is not acid free and so I'm putting some oils into the paper um, and it might make it might damage the paper over time. Um, but it fills in really, really solidly. And since I'm not going to do anything else in the background, what I do to compensate for my oils is after I am all done with a picture, I make sure to spray it with an acid-free archival fixative. And that can help 
solve that problem. On this side I have less tone because I didn't crosshatch and so it's naturally going to come out lighter. And you can see how on both sides those indented lines are just popping out. I don't like this side as much because it's not as smooth. So I'm going to go back in with the chamois cloth and see if I can't smooth that out a little bit more. Here's my chamois cloth. It's the same motion, these circle strokes. And that definitely is taking out some of that line work and smoothing it out for me. So thank you, chamois cloth. I like this. I like the way that there's a really distinct difference between the light side and the dark side. I'm gonna go around his face with the chamois cloth. So I get that sort of halo effect that I see in my picture. And I'm going all the way to the edge of my paper and the edge of his figure. So that looks marvelous. And when I'm done, I'm going to remove the frisket film. Peel, peel, peel. You can see those little hairs. Fabulous. So now we start tone work on the man. I'm going to get my reference materials close. I'm going to keep my borders taped off while I do this part. And most importantly, I'm going to get a clean piece of paper that I can rest my arm against so that I don't smear. Okay. If I want any more indented lines that would go over the beard, I'm going to put those, I mean that would go over the suit, I'm going to put those in now. And then I'm going to move to a harder charcoal pencil. You could also use graphite, just be aware that um, you can go over the top of charcoal with graphite, but not vice versa. So if you make a graphite background and then think you can darken it up with charcoal, eh, you can't. Graphite is too slippery, so nothing will layer over the top of it. Also, a benefit of working with charcoal is that it's not shiny for the same reason. The molecular shape 
of the graphite is smooth and it reflects light. So especially if you have a lot of it, you try to make something really, really dark with graphite, it's gonna still be shiny. Not good, not bad, just a fact, so keep that in mind when you're choosing your medium. But I'm going to start with my charcoal pencil and I'm going to lay down some tone for the skin tone. I'm using a really light touch here, especially on the shadow, especially on the highlight side of the face. And if you need to redraw any lines before you start this, do that because you don't want to lose your road map as you start adding tone. Use a really light touch though and I'm covering everything basically because this is a base skin tone. It's not even a shadow. It is the color of the skin itself. The reason I'm not going into this area or at least not all of it, is because I know that with blending, I'm going to wind up getting some tone over there. And I'm also going to add some tone into the beard just a little bit and the tone of the neck. Ooh, and I never did get that necklace up to snuff, so I'm going to need to draw that before I do too much work down here in the chest too. I'll do I'll do a little bit of work here though. For you doing this at home, get your necklace drawn all the way and the chain before you start adding tone. Then I'm going to blend that skin tone with a stomp. This is a stomp, it's basically rolled paper. It looks like a pencil. And I like to use stomps for smaller areas like this. Ugh, except I'm not liking this one. It's kind of scratchy. Let me see if I can get it done with my uh, chamois cloth instead. Find a cleanish spot on the chamois. And then I'm going to use circle strokes and just blend, 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 blend all of that tone. You see how much of it just gets blended away. But this way, the base of the skin is never going to look as white as the paper. Unless you have some really, really intense lighting with really bright highlights, your skin tone is never going to be as bright as the brightest white of your paper. So this initial pass is important to do, to just make it a little bit more realistic, a little less ghosty. Then I'm going to do the same thing again, but this time I'm focusing on the shadow sides. So this time I'm putting in the big shape of the shadow that falls over the face in one big piece. And if you've heard me do tutorials before, you know that I'm big on the one big piece thing and looking for the shapes of the shadows. It's because that will tie your face together and make it look a lot more realistic than if you do these little piecemeal, like shading the eyes separately from the nose and so on and so forth. After all, the light doesn't stop and start again at every feature. It goes over the top. 
and it hits everything and then it makes these different patterns the sharpness of the edge and so on it's going to show the viewer how steep that curve is but everything is getting hit by light at the same time so similarly you should hit everything with your shadows at the same time after I push this forward a little and I'll do this over the entire face I'm going to go back with my stomp and I'm going to gently blend it smooth like this using little circle strokes circle 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 and I'm gonna have to be very careful that I get all the way to the edge so it doesn't look like my man is cut out and placed on top of the background but rather that he is just standing in front of it and it's going all the way around him with the circle strokes though I can disguise my individual charcoal strokes and get rid of anything that looks too pencil-y go into the shadows around the face and in the wrinkles the same way and then when I get to the smaller details I'll do that a little bit differently but this is what I'm going to do I'm going to put this big shadow shape that falls over the entire face into the hair this side of the face down the nose into the beard and down here on the neck I'm going to put all of that in as one big shape and blend it smooth then I'll come back and show you how to push forward from there okay I've done a little bit of work in this shadow the darkest shadow on his face a lot left to do of course so let's get back to it I want to show you how to do some work in the hair and how to polish up the features to sharpen them up so when you're adding strokes to the hair I like to start with some main strokes that help tell the story of the hair growth so he has a really simple little foof and foof hairstyle that goes up around and down and then once I have that sort of filled in I'm going to add some tone like this following the same direction of that hair growth and then you have some places where the hair lifts up off the scalp and it's really dark in these shadow areas I'd like to go in before we get too dark and just make sure that I have a few of these hairs darkened this um, obviously is going to work best when you have white paper let's just indent some lines there you can see it still works when I in doubt and then go darker over the top ooh that looks nice and add some shadow to the light part of his hair here and some darker shadow up here okay I'm gonna do the same sort of thing in the beard I'm going to follow the direction of the hair growth and I'm using just a light scumbling stroke with the side of the pencil. Using a charcoal pencil is nice, especially if you have a tooth, a paper with a little bit of tooth to it because you can pick up an interesting texture and if you don't smooth it too much, the texture of the 
charcoal on the paper will give you something that looks like hair just on its own. It's kind of rough and bristly and it skips over the paper a little bit. So it works really well. And if I keep his smooth, I keep, and if I smooth his skin and don't smooth the hair, or at least don't smooth it as much, it will help to keep those two distinct textures. Go in and add a little bit of detail to the ear. Complete with shadow. And while you're working on the features of the face, you want to make sure not to outline. Remember, there are no lines on the face. It's just the appearance of lines because the contours caused by light and shadow. So sometimes as an artist, you have to give the indication of line, but whenever you draw a line, make sure that you blend out one side of it so that you keep a really distinct edge, but your face doesn't turn outlined like a coloring book. As I work on a portrait, I always repeat in my head, there are no lines on the face. There are no lines on a face. And that helps me to always remember that I need to blend out one side of any line that I put down. So here's how I would blend that out. I'm blending on the top here. And I'm just letting that edge go into the shadow. It sort of melts into shadow. And I'm going to add some more detail in this eye. When you're working on the eyes, make sure that you keep a highlight. If there is one, that's going to add a lot of life because it will help make the surface of the eye look wet. and some shadows in the corners of the eye. Help it to look three-dimensional like a ball. And I could just use my stomp and fill in some tone for the iris. They sell stomps in all kinds of different sizes, so make sure that you use the size that you need to. Um, so make sure that you're using the size that you need for the feature. The eye is obviously really small, so I just grab a smaller stomp. And for sharpening your pencil, you can use a sandpaper pad that will save the wood. This is my little sandpaper pad. It's attached to a piece of wood. and um, that helps me to keep a nice clean tip. So I have some shading there, and then on this side, the eye needs to be dark and yet less distinct because this is all going to be in deeper shadow. Remember, that's why I had to print out several different pieces of reference. So now I'm just kind of going around the face, adding some darker shadows where they need to be, like under the nostril. Under the nose. Here where the lips would be, even though you can't see lips, there's still a shadow. And I'm going to also add some shading in between the little hairs, hairs of the beard. Now make sure that you don't make the beard and the mustache the same value as the rest of the face or it won't look any different from the face.
this side of the face that's in shadow is very, very dark. It's even darker than the background next to it. So I'm going to circle over another time, really darken up those values. And I always have my reference material really close as I work so that I can constantly refer to what I see. So this is just a slow process of building up more definition by putting down line and blending out with a stomp. Lightening if I need to with my kneaded eraser and then adding more tone again with the pencil. Just takes a while and it takes a lot of patience. But the process is always that same one, two, three. One, two, three, one, two, three, tone, blend, lighten, tone, blend, lighten. It's more effective when I cover even more of the eye with the tone there. And you'll notice how much you really do fill in um, as a viewer. There's just the barest indication, like here, there's just a small indication of where the eye should go. The viewer fills in an eye for you. And because it's so dark, I know that I'm just on the shadow side of the face. So pay attention to what you're seeing on your reference material and put it down the same way that you see it. If you're effective here, then you're going to wind up with the same story that you see on your reference material. Now I'm just going to go into the hair a little bit, soften with a uh, stomp here. Looking good, looking very beardy and old manny. For those wrinkles on his face, I have some light tone down and then I can just squash my kneaded eraser into a blade like this and pull out tiny, tiny little white lines. And that's going to be enough to show some detail in the skin and to make it look like wrinkles and um, some pores. So you can sharpen up, remember there are no lines like I said, but when you're blending out one side you can make an even sharper edge by lightening the opposite side with your kneaded eraser. So that's the other step there. Now let's say that I had finished this all up and I was ready to move into the suit. The first thing I'm going to do is check out my reference material and note that I have a dark side and a light side for the suit and that it's important to keep these highlights because they tell the story of the type of material that the suit is made of. So I'm going to start by cleaning up the lines, the lines of the lapel and the lines of the suit here. And then I'm going to turn the paper on the side. I'm going to make sure I have plenty of indented lines right up here. because that's where I'm about to start working. And I'm going to fill in, yeah, those indented lines just pop out, don't they? Nice. I'm leaving a very light edge of highlight on this side of the suit, because that will be like reflected highlight that will help this to look three-dimensional. 
and then I'm going to indicate where this shadow or where this highlight is. There's also a bit of a highlight on the very edge of the fold. So it doesn't look like this suit is too thin so that it's creasing really sharply. And then I'm just going to circle stroke to fill it all in. Just like we did in the background. And this side is so dark I can't even see where the arm is. That's a problem with photography. I'm working from a photo here, so the photography, the camera has flattened the image down. Realistically though, I should be able to see um, where the arm separates from the body. So I might want to indicate that anyway. And then there's a really heavy on this side, there's, there's a really heavy shadow on this side of the suit. It's pretty even and smooth. Okay. But anyway, step two here is going to be to blend with the circle strokes. And then I'm going to blend over this highlight edge that I kept so that I'll have a nice natural gradation from light to dark. and I'll tone down that little edge that I kept white as well. I don't want it to be too glaringly white. I just want there to be some division between the foreground and the background. if I go over the top of that shape that I left white it will remain lighter than the rest of the suit but it's not standing out so baldly anymore I think I'm gonna go over it a little bit more and then I'm gonna pluck it out with my kneaded eraser to make it a little bit sharper good. I'm going to do the same thing on the other side and on the top of the shirt as well. I'm using a broken thin line and then underneath the shirt here I'll vary it and the line is a little bit thicker where the line where the collar is in shadow and it gets really light where it's being struck by light. For the chest hairs, if you forget to indent the lines, the other step that you um, the other method that you can use to pull those tiny little hairs out is to press the kneaded eraser into a blade and pull them out that way. Then you can sharpen them up with your pencil by just darkening one side of each little hair. but I think that the indenting method works quite a bit better. So I'm going to get rid of some of this tone just a bit. And I'm going to indent my paper. I 
this will quickly and more accurately give me those fine bristly looking chest hairs. I'm going to do the same thing to add tone to this side, just like I did in the background. I'm going to keep it a little bit lighter. And now I'm going to go off camera and push up the face and push up the suit a little bit. Then I'll come back and show you how to put the detail in the chain. I've pushed him up a little bit. And let me focus in on some of these details, just a skosh. You can see that I added some tone to the side of the uh, suit here, and then I just erased out some light lines with my kneaded eraser. I added some shadows, but obviously those are still really rough, and put some shadows in his beard. But it was just the same process, pulling out some highlights with a kneaded eraser, adding more tone as needed, and um, blending with a little stomp. So now let me show you how to put in this chain. The chain is a complex pattern and it's metal which means that it's going to cast really strong darks and have really bright highlights. So the first step is to make sure that your area is clean. I'm going to erase a little bit more right up here because if you don't have really bright white paper to begin with you have no chance of getting those bright white highlights. Then step two, redraw the basic shape, which I've already done. So I just gave myself a rough guideline for what size the chain is going to be and the angle that it's going to fall on his neck. And then study your reference material. Get that pencil really nice and sharp. and then go ahead once you know how the pattern falls you can start to draw it in so what I do in situations like this I don't pay too much attention to each individual tiny piece I get the shape of the hole so I know I'm following the right angle the right shape I know I'm going to end up in about the right spot I memorize the pattern and then I just fill in as well as I can. So I'm not going to count these tiny pieces of chain link. I know that if I just take my time and I pay attention to what I see, I'll get there. I'm going to finish that up and then after it's all drawn, Step two is to add the um, shadow pattern. So with that pencil nice and sharp again, I'm going to add the darks. You might not even blend. It depends on how small the pattern is and how dark it is. Whenever you blend, you run the risk of lightening it up. And if you draw in the wrong place, then you're going to lose a highlight and that's not good. So you just have to use a lot of time, a lot of patience, and fill in exactly what you see, starting as always with those large shapes. And I'm going to do the same thing in the pattern of the necklace itself. I have this really dark spiral. So once I've drawn the outside, I'm going to add some darks, and then I'm going to add all of the darks. I don't focus on the lines, I focus on the shapes of the dark shadows. It's those shadow shapes that tell the story of the pattern here. See how I just fill in, concentrating on that shadow shape. And it's really dark on this side. And I'm going to see some chest hairs. Those have been indented. 
and around the outside of the chain as well because every chain link is casting a shadow on his chest. Just take your time and make sure that everything makes sense. All right, so your shadows need to be cast in the right direction. Any little thing like that is going to cause a disturbance for the viewer. They'll know that something is wrong. They might not be able to place it. But their eye will tell them immediately that something just doesn't look right because we've all seen people caught in the shadows and we all know the way the shadows are going to fall. So if you mess that up, it's going to cause a bit of a problem. I'm going to add some tone to the chest, starting in the darkest area and then going a lot lighter. And I'm going to do most of this work off camera, but I just wanted to show you how I'm going to do it. Look for those large shapes and then I'll lighten up with some more tone around. Then I'm going to move to my stomp and circle out. See I didn't even add tone in most of this but I know that the tone here is so dark that if I start by blending in that dark tone I can add the mid-tone without even picking up my pencil just by dragging the stomp into the lighter patch. See, that's why you always go from dark to light. And if need be, once you've blended and it's down to this gray, you can always pluck out some more individual hairs with a kneaded eraser. It's going to work best if your tones are really fairly light, like they are here. And then you're going to have to clean the eraser by squeezing it after every pass or two. And then to make it look more like hairs, accent one side. Just like this. And don't forget that some of the hairs can be drawn too. Like around here on the side of the beard, going into the darkness. Some of these hairs standing out are actually darker than the background. So they can just be drawn with your pencil. Some of these hairs and some of these hairs by the face. Just remember to follow the direction of the hair growth as you draw each line and um, try to dry each hair with one stroke. Okay, so let me finish up this necklace and then I'll come back to you one more time and if it's finished we can remove the tape border and you can see the way it would look framed. All right, I have added the final details that I want to add. I've added some more darks to the chain <clears throat> and I am ready to take the tape off. So let's do that really carefully here. Taking tape off paper, you need to just go slowly and stop at the first sign of tearing, which hopefully there won't be any, but it has happened before. Wonderful. <clears throat> so I got lucky. Here's the original and here's the drawing. Looks like there's a piece of glitter on there or something. There we go. And so that is all there is to it. You just take it step by step. To get those tiny little hairs, you need to indent the paper with the stylus. 
Uh, unfortunately, it's not focusing very well. But those little hairs do pop out and it works really well. So it's the technique to use for sure. And um, sometimes when you're doing really small things like the chains, you can use the indentation method for those too. So just use that indentation method whenever you are doing something small that needs to be kept really bright, whether that's stripes on a shirt or hairs in a beard, or little delicate highlights in a chain or any other reflective material. So that is where we're gonna leave this drawing tutorial. I hope that you've taken some things away from this portrait lesson and that you try it in your own studio. And of course, as always, I thank you so much for watching.